Welcome to the CAA 2023 webinar series. Today's webinar is ventilation in EMS, manually or mechanical. Thanks for joining us and please enjoy. Hi, my name is David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities, representing ambulance services throughout Australasia. Welcome to the latest in our CAA webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Ventilation in EMS, Manually or Mechanical. Airway management and ventilation are some of the most important yet challenging situations faced by EMS. Manual ventilation seems to be an easy task, but various studies show that it is difficult despite regular training. What is the best way to ventilate? What are the advantages of manual and mechanical ventilation? From this webinar, audience members will learn how your patient can benefit from mechanical ventilation, how mechanical ventilation improves the workflow in EMS, how to achieve hands-free ventilation during patient transport and the different possibilities of monitoring. Our speaker today is Dr. Jan Thorsten Gassner, MD. Jan is a German anesthesiologist, emergency physician, university professor, health services researcher, and director of the Institute for Rescue and Emergency Medicine at the University Hospital schleswig holstein His scientific focus is on emergency medicine quality management and especially resuscitation. Jan began his medical career in 1991 as a paramedic and continues since 2000 as a physician. Since 2010, Jan has been medical director of emergency medicine at the University Hospital Schweizerfried-Holstein. Jan is a member of ERC, ILCOR, and the Global Resuscitation Alliance, and the author of more than 180 papers, including ERC guidelines for resuscitation. He achieved his full professorship in 2018. Jan continues to be active as an emergency physician and chief emergency physician in the state capital, Kiel, and as an emergency physician on the rescue helicopter, Christoph 42. Please add any questions you have during the presentation into the chat function, and we will answer them in the live Q&A session that will immediately follow Jan's presentation. So on that note, please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Thorsten Grasner. Thank you. Ventilation in EMS, manually or mechanical? This is the question. My name is Jan Thorsten Gresner. I'm the director of the Institute of Emergency Medicine at University Hospital in Schleswig-Holstein. This is a part of Germany, the northern part, and I'm really happy to present you some of my thoughts about ventilation in EMS situations. My conflict of interest you can see on that slide. It shows that I'm involved in different registry work in resuscitation mostly and other international scientific groups but I don't think that there will be any conflict dealing with that, what we want to talk today. So just talk about emergency medicine. I know you are professionals and you know what you're doing and you know wherefore you will be alerted. And emergency medicine, I think the same in your country, in our, like in our country, is that we deal with all that life threatening situations. And one of the major differences in our system in Germany and some other European countries is that we send out doctors on scene. So there will be a doctor and the paramedics, so we are um, acting as a team. I know in other countries there are paramedics on their own. Maybe there will be some help by telephone operators from the hospitals or others. But at the end, the patient needs the treatment, what is needed. And I, th I think important that professional workers as paramedics or doctors do the right job. Here are some examples of our work, what we do in Germany, and these are situations where we were called as paramedics and also the German emergency physicians. You can see trauma, you can see cardiac arrest, you can see all the other things. These are indications um, where we send out ambulance cars and of course also doctors. I think this is a system what we are all familiar with over the last years. The A, B, C, D, E approach, the question is what will be the best way to handle different situations. And we will focus today, of course, on one part of this treatment. We look on airway just a little bit, but more on breathing, because the B in the ABCD is very important, often forgotten. So people normally say, yeah, airway, it's very important. I did a very great intubation. And then they talk about circulation or something else. Ventilation, and I'm an anesthesiologist by training, is a very important part to heal patients, but also if you do it in the wrong way, 
to harm patients. So it's important to talk about um, the part of breathing and one of the most important sentences in every treatment is of course, keep calm and treat first what kills first. And when we talk about ventilation, I think it's important to know why we do that. But just a short um, interruption. When we talk about ventilation and ask the artificial intelligence what they think about what is ventilation and I did a nice try. I asked uh, the um, artificial intelligence to draw an image of paramedics providing mechanical ventilation in an ambulance. This was the question. And um, these are the answers from the um, drawing artificial intelligence. And I think it's um, a little bit spooky. And if you see that different things, this looks a little bit like a really team approach between the patient and the paramedic. On the other hand side, I think it's um, a little bit like Captain Future or something else and far away from the reality. This is what is reality. So if you look at a picture like this, then you can see two paramedics work in an ambulance car. You can see the ventilator rear upside and the patient in this case is um, fully um, ventilated and intubated. So this is something what we saw, I think, in 10 to 15% of our ambulance calls in Germany. So at the end, it's not so often, it's not every day, but it's with 10 to 15% something what is regular um, in the work of the paramedics and they have to do this in a on a very high level and again it's a life threatening situation and it's a life critical situation when you do and you need ventilation for a patient so it's important that we know what we are doing. But why ventilation in EMS? We can also say why ventilation in life and we know without ventilation, without breathing, without oxygen we have a problem as uh, mankind to survive. So why ventilation in EMS? Of course we need oxygen. This is part one. People and patients, but also we as uh, um, professionals need oxygen to live. So what is the primary goal in ventilation? Of course, it's to deliver oxygenation. People must have oxygen in their blood. So we want to higher the level of the oxygen saturation. This is very important and this is the most thing, the most important thing what we think of when we talk about ventilation. But on the other hand side, we have to also organize a CO2 removal. So at the end, ventilation is doing both, giving oxygen and CO2 removal. And then we have that what we normally do when we are breathing, breathing in, oxygen in, breathing out, CO2 out. And this is the normal way what we have to do for the patient when he's not able to do and to ventilate or to breathe on its own. The big question is now, what is the best way to ventilate? What is easy? What is feasible? What can we do? who is prepared for doing ventilation and are there any uh, obstacles what maybe give us a problem in the field of emergency medicine. So how to ventilate in EMS? We talk not about the theater, we don't talk about an ICU ward where we can plan all the things. We talk about emergency situations in the field at home of the patient and different other things. And we can see here two options how we can ventilate. We can have on the one hand side the mechanical one with the ventilator. We can on the other hand side, you can see here at the edge, the back and the mask. So the easiest way to ventilate. And we have to discuss today, and maybe we can do that later on, what is the best way to get oxygen in and CO2 out. So when we talk about that ventilation topic, we have to think about what are the advantages, what are the obstacles of the different things. So manual and mechanical ventilations have some things that are very good, some are easy, some may cause a problem and I like to describe you and to show you the different things what we can discuss about both ways of ventilate a patient. The easiest way, what every one of you may think of, is the back valve mask ventilation. You need a bag, a non-breathing valve, an oxygen reservoir and you can start immediately. This is the easiest way from the technical side. So the equipment is just that what you see on that slide. Nevertheless, the technique to get someone ventilated, to get the mask right into the face of the patient and then do a ventilation is nothing what you can do without any training. This is something what an anesthesiologist train over some months before it, it works really well. It's the same as for paramedics. It's very important to handle that and to do that very simple technique things with the yeah, more or less uh, sophisticated work what you have to do with this just the bag. 
So at the end, a mask in the face of the patient, what we can see here, one part of the ventilation is to put the mask as tight as possible on the face of the patient. This looks very easy on that face because this is a clear face. This is not old. There are teeth in. So everything nice. But it could be different. You can have a um, hair in your uh, face. You can have some maybe um, fracture. You can have uh, maybe some um, other um, abnormalities in the face that may cause problems with the mask. This looks very easy. But one hand is blocked just for that. And if it's not working, you need a second hand just to hold the mask. And then you need a second person to do the ventilation on the back. Look at the normal back and I think you know all that volumes, but just to remind you um, that 600 milliliters is that what we normally in 80, 90 kilogram patient need to ventilate them in normal conditions. And a normal bag has a typical bag is 1.8 to 2 liters. There are smaller bags with one liter, but then think about it's not, there's no need to put all the air, all the oxygen out of that bag fully into the patient. From a one liter bag, it's half of the bag what you need. From a two liter bag, this is a typical bag what we use in Germany, it's a little bit like than one third of this volume. And what we want to see is a small rise of the chest. This is what we want to achieve. We want to see that there's air going in, but there's no need for hyperventilation. We will see some slides later that hyperventilation can also cause difficulties with the patient and for the patient. So, Please remember 600 milliliters, so 6 to 8 milliliters per 100 kilogram, uh, per kilogram per um, patient is something what we can think, but when you see the chest is rising, you can be happy with that, what you are doing. The goal, and I said, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve oxygenation for the patient and an oxygenation saturation over 90% or greater, depending on what kind of patient you have, depending on what guidelines you follow when you remember maybe the latest guidelines from um, the European Society of Cardiology. They talk about saturations just over 19 for pi uh, people with uh, myocardial infarction. For me as an anesthesiologist, a level over 90 just is not enough. So we like more 95 or more, but it depends on the um, cause of uh, the problem from the patient. So maybe 90%, 95% or up to 99% but definitely more than 90% is a goal what we want to achieve with our ventilation. So set a goal and find the way to achieve this goal. But there's one thing I really want to yeah, come back to. So many people say, oh, the easiest way of ventilation is just give me a bag and a mask and I can do the job. Maybe you train one or two times on a mannequin and say, it's easy. When you did it in field, when you did it in hospital, when you train it on real victims, then you figure out that it is much co more complicated than you think before. And the only answer for that, to hear that, is training. So the only way to learn ventilation with a mask and a bag is do it. You have to work with it, you have to do it on the patient, you have to do it in the best way under controlled conditions in the theater. And uh, on the ICU maybe, it depends what ICU you have. But this is something you have to learn before you must do it on the street when you are running your EMS car. So it's not easy, it's not complicated, it's just something to train, yes of course, but please be aware that it is something that there's a learning curve, there's a learning way and a path what you have to go when you want to do it in a good way. Our biggest mistake what we see in young colleagues in Germany is that they say, ah, give me the bag, give me the mask, there's no problem, one, two, three, it works. In real life, we cause a lot of problems with that when the mask is not fitting, when the ventilation is not good. And something what we often saw, when the mask is really good and you can do everything fine, then in a way of being very stressed on your own, people squeeze the whole back and put one and a half liter into the patient. And this makes a hyperventilation and gives us problems with other yeah, changes in blood gases for the patient. So. There are some older papers, and I don't um, will bore you with a lot of um, uh, scientific papers, but this is one of the older ones from 2013, uh, published in Actors Anesthesiology of Scandinavica. And they look at the probability and this check the chance what you can do. And again, 
A problem is the tidal volume. You don't know what you put in. You can hyperventilate from the frequency, but you can also hyperventilate from the volume what you apply. And again, when you're under stress, when you're under pressure, the typical reaction is that you give more volume than you normally need it because you try to push all of the back into the patient. And this is something that really causes problems. So more is not often better especially in ventilation, and so uh, keep that please in mind. The mask and the face is one point, the volume of the ventilation, the other point. And what we also saw in a paper from 2014, also a little bit older, that prolonged manual ventilation with a back uh, valve device is harmful and often increases patient's mortality. Why is it so? Because you get tired. You put your hand, you are not really sure if it's working, you don't uh, control the volume, you don't control the frequency, maybe the frequency is possible, but the volume is very difficult with a normal back. So um, how longer you do that ventilation in a manual base, and especially if you don't control it with a capnography, that you see what you're doing with the CO2, so often and so more you get problems with the patient. There are really no randomized control trials dealing with that. Of course not, because you can't do good ventilation, bad ventilation as a trial. But a lot of data, and especially that what you can see here in that paper, shows that the problem what we can have when we do a longer manual ventilation. But maybe we can see your experience later in the discussion. You can tell me how you handle that. Another important problem is, and you can see it on that small pictures here, we look at the ventilation, where should the air go? The air should go into the lung. If you press too much and with too much pressure, air also goes into, so the typical thing on that screen, I always run one time in the wrong direction, but you can see here, air is going to the stomach. And you can do it one time, two times, three times, and what happens then, that is what in the stomach, uses the weight coming out. And then we have a problem that you try to ventilate someone who is vomiting. And you know from real life experience, this is a really harmful situation for the patient. First problem, you have a not clear airway. You have to clear the airway. Before you do that, you maybe don't see that. And some of that vomiting fluids come from the stomach and go directly into the lung. Next problem. After you recognize it and then you clear the airway and you clean the airway, second problem is it costs you time. So you can't ventilate in that time and this all causes lower saturation for the patient and then in critical situations something but really is harmful. So keep in mind the mask must be in the right position. Second thing, the volume must be in the right way, not too much. It's not only hyperventilation, it's also insufflating the stomach and the problems what can occur after that. So, mask ventilation, easy, fast, with a question mark. Fast, yes, easy. We have to see safe, absolutely not 100% safe, because you can cause a lot of problems for the patient when you're doing not right. And we have a latest paper. This is coming out in November this year. It was a um, study in uh, three different parts of uh, United States and Canada and they analyze different things. I make it a little bit bigger. And in this studies, they um, just check for um, cardiac arrest patients and the ventilation and um, figured out that there was a feeling of you do a ventilation, but at the end, only 40% of the patients got a really good ventilation. And the authors conclude that um, adequate ventilation through a BVM remains a difficult skill to perform properly and must be practiced to maintain professionally. So again, the same answer, latest paper, what you can find on the market at the moment, highly um, published in circulation, so a really good journal. And the answer is the same. It's not easy You have to train it to be um, successful and not harmful for the patient. Okay. What is the alternative? And I know that in different countries, the alternative is train and do manual ventilation. The other alternative is maybe using an automatic or mechanical ventilator. And in Germany, we are very familiar with using ventilators. So it could be a good idea to use a ventilator that is helping you for frequency, for volume and for all the other things. So what could be the positive side effects? You have 
two hands. You can work with that two hands and can say back, what? When you have it connected with maybe a machine, you have both hands free for other things, like in that picture, that you can do other things what you have to do. But this is more than that. We know all ventilators in the different ways. You can see here high-end ventilators from the ICU. You can see here a picture on the ICU, or you can see, oops, again, the older versions of ventilators, what we can find here or there. This year, this small machine here is uh, not a ventilator on a high-end level. This is something that was built during the COVID crisis from some engineers that said, we are running out of ventilators and they use a bag, they use a machine that squeezes the bag and use it as, as a very, very simple mechanical ventilator. This is something what comes out of crisis. This is something what comes out of engineer work. And this is what we know from the ICU. All that high-tech fancy things. So, ventilators in daily life you can find in the operation room, in emergency departments, of course, and critical care transport units on helicopters or cars. And um, this is something what is very normal. In EMS, on daily work as really high urge patients when you arrive there at their home or somewhere else. It really depends on the culture of uh, EMS, the, um, the training level and of course of the equipment what, you're, what is available if you use mechanical ventilators or you have to stay with just the bag. And when I started my paramedic career, when I, before I became an emergency physician, I was a paramedic and when I think about my start as a paramedic, we had ventilators like ooh, this one. So very easy, you can say on off, you can say 100% oxygen or 21, you can say pressure maybe, but more it was volume what you can um, put in. So um, this was something what is very easy, 12 times 500 milliliters, go ahead. Modern ventilators like that can do much more and have much more options to do ventilation like in an ICU, like in a uh, theater. So um, it's more or less that you transfer the technique from the hospital to the EMS field and make it smaller and um, not so heavy so we can use it outside the hospital. And exactly this is something what is, um, was maybe one of the key points during the last years. When ventilators are as big as a ventilator in the hospital, and remember my first ICU transfers, we used the ventilator from the ICU. We have to fix it in the ambulance car, transfer patients, so it was a horrible workload to transfer a ventilated patient. And over the last years, we found ventilators much smaller, but on the same level of technique what we have in the uh, on the ICU. So they were usable in the field of 911 or 000 responding ambulances. And this is something what we can use in daily work. So the question is, and this is something for the discussion, will this manual uh, mechanical ventilators, the small transportable ventilators help you in the field of EMS like that on that picture here? with a patient with this, which is intubated and uh, controlled ventilated. So especially when you have to run over longer distance, when you go for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour or one hour transfer time. And um, I just think about long distance also in Australia that maybe cause a very long transfer time to the next hospital that uh, the ventilation with the back could be a problem. So this may be a good solution for that, what we can do, but it's not only all. This is not all, just to have it easier for you. The question is, what are the advantages in mechanical ventilation really for the patient? And what is the big advantage, what maybe helps you? And the first thing what we can see on ventilators, instead of a bag, you find a lot of nice things to press. This is not a picture of a ventilator, of course. This is a picture of a sailboat and you can press a lot of buttons to say on, off, whatever. And you can control all the other things. This is very old and analog, not high-tech digital. But a little bit like you can press this button and that, and you can change things here. Invites you to do that. Remember the first ventilators that I show you some slides ago when you said on, off, 12 times, 500, everything is fine, it's easy, but maybe not customized or not tailored for the patient. And nowadays we have a lot of things what we can adjust on a ventilator. So back from that to the background of what we can adjust when we ventilate patients with a mechanical ventilator. We can talk about ventilation frequency. We just can say 12, 20, 50, whatever you need for smaller babies, up to adults. So you can exactly set up the frequency. 
you can talk about ventilation pressure, you can define the ventilation pressure, you can define the maximum pressure what's in the patient. On the other hand side, depending on the way how you ventilate, you can use systems that can directly say this is the ventilation volume what I want to give. And the machine is giving exactly that ventilation volume. Of course, simple things like um, adjusting a PEEP in that way, what you want, 0, 5, 10, whatever for ICU patients higher, maybe 15. You can use on a ventilator, mechanical ventilator, and you can control the FeO2, so the fraction of um, inspired oxygen, um, from 21 up to every way, up to 100%. So it's more tailored. And how more options you have to change things, so um, some more options you have to maybe put the wrong things together. So ventilation with a mechanical ventilator is not as easy as it was maybe 15 years before, 20 years before, just on off, but it's more tailored. And then there's the need for training and also to be familiar with your machine when you're using that. But this is a list of things what we can achieve very correct and very um, you know, defined with a mechanical ventilator. What can we do? And the technique to ventilate, um, I think this is very important from that what we see um, during the last years. And when I started my paramedic career, we just had volume control. We started with invasive ventilation. People had a tube inside the trachea. There was no super vertical airway or something like that. Then we have the control mode, and then we have the volume control. As I said, 12 times, 500 milliliter, go. We know that normal ventilation, what we all are doing, is nothing that we said we want 500 milliliters in. Now we said there's a different pressure. And what we are doing when we breathe normally, we have a negative pressure by the rise of the chest. Volume will follow. We lose that pressure. Volume will go out. This is the way as we normally breathe. And over the last, I think, 20 years, we came from ventilators with volume control to ventilators with pressure control. The big difference is, if you say I want a volume, you define the volume, you define a maximum pressure level and the machine will give that volume up to that level of, you said this is maybe harmful. So you have a clear volume if everything is on the right way for the patient. If there's a blockage in the tube or something with the patient, maybe he's not sleeping well, then there may of course be some problems with the volume but normally you say 12 times 500 go ahead on the other hand side when we talk about pressure control as a pressure control ventilation would say you say this is the maximum pressure what should be in the patient and of course a pressure can be in one patient enough to have 500 milliliters and another patient maybe 600 milliliters and other patients maybe it's only 300 milliliters volume so if you use a pressure control ventilation it's important to control the volume. When you do your volume con uh, ventilation, you have to control the pressure, especially the maximum pressure. If you do a pressure controlled ventilation, then the pressure is always on the same level, but you have to control for the volume what is following and maybe um, add or change some of your um, things what you want to do on the ventilator. This is invasive ventilation. Is for patients that are intubated, is for patients that um, are narcotic or in cardiac arrest or something like that. Nowadays, we have another option to do ventilation. This is so-called no non-invasive ventilation, or NIF, or however you will um, use the words for that. And we have two options for that. We can do controlled ventilation, B-level, pressure controlled, when we help people to breathe, or we can just adjust a positive um, airway pressure, so a little bit like continuous positive airway pressure is nothing else than you help someone to have a minimum level of PEEP and people are breathing on their own. And the mixture between BPAP, fully controlled, non-invasive, and CPAP, just a pressure in the lung after they have the expiration, like a normal PEEP is doing, the mixture between both is possible. So you can start with a help of keeping pressure on the thorax up to do ventilation for someone who is not able to ventilate on its own but everything in between can exactly support the patient that what he needs maybe he needs a frequency he's only breathing five times and the machine can help him to breathe ten times because five times the patient's working five times the machine 
the patient is only able to breathe maybe and then, then create a pressure of maybe 10 or 15. And the machine can help for the next 10 to 15, up to 30, um, to get air into the patient. So this is a very nice version of assisted ventilation, what we can offer the patient, and there's no need to intubate them for that. So in Germany, over the last year, it was more and more common to use this non-invasive ventilation. And many of the ventilators of the modern ones, you can see here, it's a CPAP mode, it's somewhere there, yeah, um, can be also used for non-invasive ventilation, and you can uh, be mustn't intubate or put a supraglottic airway into the patient so it's really a non-invasive not only ventilation but also non-invasive uh, way to uh, ventilate patient without doing any advanced airway treatment. You can see here is a patient sitting with this mask, the CPAP mask in his face and the chance without an endotracheal tube, without any airway device can be ventilated and assisted and we saw a lot of patients especially in the older ones with breathing problems, when we started, they look like that you have to intubate them. After a treatment with the uh, non-invasive ventilation, maybe over 10, 15 minutes, they directly get a good support. The saturation will coming up and patients get more and more relaxed. And we saw a lot of patients that we 20 years ago would have to intubate because they are so in trouble that now will be, they are really treated and healed in that situation by non-invasive ventilation. So a really positive impact during the last years what we can do for the patient. And here are just some examples. You can Google them, I did the same, I Googled them and asked wherefore is a ventilator in non-invasive ventilation mode good? And you can see for COPD. You can see it's for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You mustn't always intubate the patient. Years ago, patient with um, uh, pulmonary edema needs a lot of furosemid and a tube and then they are intensive care patients. Nowadays, we give them some morphine, we give them some of the diuretics and put on the non-invasive ventilation and patients will be much better relaxed when we arrive at the hospital, especially when we have long transfer times and we keep them away from invasive airway management. A very positive thing. Of course, RDS, more complicated, uh, surely, but also can be treated with um, the non-invasive ventilation, a pneumonia, that people are not able to heal, to keep pressure in the thorax, and you can want to keep the lung open, so a nice way with CPAP that you can do that, and also asthma or other neuromuscular disorders. So, when we think about the mode of ventilation, the non-invasive way is coming up more and more common also for treatments in Germany in EMS field and the number of patients that need really an um, advanced airway and need a ventilation fully controlled drops down over the years. So a positive um, solution for the patient, from my opinion. But how can a, bene can a patient benefit from mechanical ventilation? Let's think about what I talked before. So I think the answers we had some slides before. The patient can, at the end, have a positive impact while we can control the ventilation frequency. We can control the ventilation pressure to keep the patient away from high pressure and that may be harm the lung. We can define the maximum pressure. We can define volumes or control for volumes. And of course, we can adjust PEEP as we want and control the FeO2. So from the technical thing and from the patient tailored or customized ventilation, I think a mechanical ventilator has a lot of um, positive points on its side so that we can think about this could be helpful. But remember one of the first slides, we're just talking now, or I just talked now, just about getting air in. So we have some positive pressure ventilation, we get air in the patient, but we have to really control what we are doing, especially if we're doing volume uh, um, pressure controlled ventilation. So we can define all that tidal volume, the pressure, the rate, but to control what we are doing, we need the SO2 uh, to uh, measure the saturation of um, the blood with oxygen, but also when breathing, when we remember that it's not only getting oxygen in, it's also putting CO2 out, there's a need for controlling that. And this is another ventilator you can see here on the lower level, there's CO2 control. So we can see in a patient we do ventilation, 
we can see the flow and the frequency and we can see the CO2 when we have the capnography. And capnography, instead of capnometry, when you only have numbers, is a very important thing. And if you look at this, um, yeah, this part, I make it a little bit bigger uh, and later on, we have the chance to have a really good idea of what is happening in the lung. How is the ventilation really going on? It's not only about gas exchange, it's also, is my ventilation doing well? And if you, oops, I'm too fast. And we can see on that slide, this capnography uh, graph. And we can see what is happening in the expiration. In the expiration, uh, CO2 is coming out of the lung. And after patient has breathed out with the next ventilation, it drops down when we have the inspiration. We don't see CO2 coming out, of course, because it's inspiration. In the expiration, the same thing happens here again. And looking on that graph gives you a lot of information. If the graph from now to the next seconds drop down to zero, there's some disconnection. You mustn't look at the patient. Of course, you have to look at the patient. But if it just dropped down to zero from now to a second later, the typical cause is you have a disconnection of your tube. If you see it's going down slowly, 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 then you can think about how to have a ventilation problem or what is the way to get CO2 to the lung? It's by the circulation. So if it goes lower, 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 you have to check for the circulation because if you do a good ventilation, your ventilator is working, but the CO2 is going down, maybe not enough CO2 is coming to the lung. And the reason for that is cardiac problems, output problems, or maybe cardiac arrest. On the other hand side, if you do a CPR and have a very low CO2 level and people got lost, the CO2 comes up very, very fast on your capnography um, overview because at the moment when the patient gets ROSC and is able to um, have a normal or near to normal heart function, all that CO2 that was stored in the um, blood can be um, getting out of the patient. So the CO2 is a very good measurement instrument for um, the critical patient, but especially for ventilated patients, you can see a lot of things in the capnogram and can find problems or on the other side can be sure that your ventilation is good. So CO2, look at the ventilator and look at the SO2, gives you all of the information what you need for a good controlled ventilation. So do a patient benefit from mechanical ventilation? It depends. It depends really on the user because we talked about what is easy, what we can have at all the time. A, mechan a mechanical ventilator with only three things to change would be easier but not tailored for the patient. Modern ones, you have a lot of things what you can do and it, at the end it depends on the user what he's able to do. When we think about the whole process of an EMS call, what we suggest and what we're doing in real life, we start at the beginning with that what we can do very fast. And I think the fastest thing is opening your um, box, getting the mask, getting the bag and start ventilation. This would be the fastest way, but you can also train it with ventilators, but the easiest way, and this is common in EMS, just get the bag and start. This is something if you want to be very fast. It's a beginning, you have to be fast, especially when patients are um, without breathing, maybe in cardiac arrest. As soon as possible, you should think about being safe, being controlled, being controlled for ventilation rate, being controlled for volume, being controlled for uh, pressure. And this is not possible with a bag and a mask. So therefore, there may be a change after a very short period, depending on the patient, before we um, can or when we can change from manual to mechanical. And I think this is the solution what we can use if we have both started fast with a bag, moving very quickly to um, as soon as possible then to a ventilator to be more safe for the patient. And let me summarize with one of the uh, reference to a very big one of the emergency medicine and one of the great giants of resuscitation, Peter Suffer. And he said in the early 70s, the most sophisticated intensive care often becomes an unnecessary expensive terminal care when the pre-ICU system fails. So what we are doing wrong in the field of EMS, what we are doing maybe wrong in our field of ventilated patient over 20 minutes, half an hour or longer on the transfer to the hospital, and we are doing not good, we will harm the patient and the best ICU care, the best hospital, the best doctors in the hospital, in the emergency department have no chance to heal that 
what we may be cause of problems and um, producer of problems during the last 30 hours, 30 minutes or one hour. So ventilation, when you ask me as an anesthesiologist, I would say it's my daily business, I can do that. Ventilation in the field of EMS, I think I also can handle that, that there will be more problems than in the hospital because you have to deal with all the other facts. And what we've learned in Germany over the years is if you want to be safe, try to use techniques that helps you to be safe for the patient. And at the moment, everyone talking about customized medicine, personalized medicine, I think a ventilator is a small example, therefore, that we can customize also the treatment for patients that need ventilation. So I am hope I hope that you got some more information, but maybe also more questions about the idea of mechanical or manual ventilation. And we have the chance in the chat and during the um, discussion now to figure out what your thoughts are about mechanical and uh, manual ventilation. And I'm happy to answer your question as soon as they come. If you want to know more about our institute, here's just a small um, QR code when you can figure out a little bit more what we are doing in Germany. I say thank you that you um, invest your time to listen to my presentation and I'm happy to read and hear your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting um, and um, thought-provoking presentation um, with a great deal of content. Um, I would like to encourage our um, audience now to put some questions in the chat. This is your opportunity. Pop them in the chat and then I will ask uh, Jan the questions and uh, he will respond. But just to kick us off, um, Jan, in, um, in your, the opening of your presentation, you talked about the frequency of ventilated patients you're now seeing between 10 and 15 percent. Is that a new trend? Is that, um, an, is that continuing to track up? I think, uh, first of all, thank you for the option to have this conversation and the chance to discuss this use. So, um, the 10 to 50 percent, I think what is really increasing in Germany is the use of non invasive ventilation. This is something that is coming up more and more. And um, when I think about 20 years ago, where we treat someone with a pulmonary edema, they end up a lot of uh, frosomid. And if this not works, then intro and the fentanyl, and they got a tube and we ventilate them. Nowadays, um, I can hear more or less 80% of them with non-invasive ventilation. And the interesting part from me was at the beginning, you have to you know that people in panic and, and, and short of breath, and you help them accepting that uh, um, ventilator for maybe one minute. After that, they feel that it is working and it's a really, really good thing to, to hear them. So my personal feeling is that most of the, um, numbers that grow up in, in ventilation is, is, is based on non-invasive ventilation and of course our ICU transfers. We transfer, especially after COVID or within COVID, we transfer more and more high urge and high um, intensive care complicated uh, ventilated patients. That's great, thank you. There's a couple of comments um, in the chat. Um, what, firstly from Joshua who says, having joined a service that uses mechanical ventilators he finds it really hard to go back to only having a manual option. I can imagine that space. Any thought, any, any comments in regards to that? <laughs> I think this is, uh, so if you have your hands free and must work uh, and do the back, uh, it's of course easier, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's the same. Uh, you, have, you need to have both. I said it at the end of my presentation. I think you need both and you need a backup if the ventilator is not working, but um, if you have only a back, um, then you have all that stress to be very correct, very, um, are focused on ventilation and to be honest this will need one person on the team just doing that it's nothing you can do while you're doing other things so yes i can understand what he's saying yeah absolutely and um Sherilyn has a similar comment um where she says uh, i i think that by allowing the machine to do all the grunt work you are more free to finesse the little details for optimal resuscitation e.g adjusted tidal volumes and respiratory rate if the patient has a restrictive or stiff lung. In the past, I found that being the one on the airway with manual BVM left me with little reserves to think about much else. Exactly that is it. If you are ventilating, if you really want to do good manual ventilation, you must be focused on what you're doing. And we saw it in our own training lab here in the Institute, um, when you bring a team a little bit under pressure and you kick them a little bit and all the funny things you can do in simulator, 
you can bring them to a ventilation frequency uh, on the same uh, number as a cardiac compression uh, frequency. Just to kick the, and they're doing, if they're under stress, the same thing with the ventilator. So yes, it is a job that you have to focus on. And then one person is just uh, focusing on that. And the big problem, and I saw that very often when we um, transfer patients just the short way from the ambulance car to the helicopter. Ah, let's do it with a bag. Minimum is no one is caring for ventilation. This is one problem. The other is, ah, oh, let's give some more. So it's uncontrolled. And I think this is a, the major difference between mechanical and manual ventilation. If you are not able to control it manually, and especially when you use some technical things uh, that you can see um, the inspiration um, fraction and the expiration fraction, this is possible with the back also. But if you're not doing it, it's an uncontrolled ventilation. And I think it's in our uh, business with EMS, it's not good to do uncontrolled things. So I'm happy with that comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, interestingly, um, in Australia, post-COVID, um, a number of ambulance services inherited a lot of ventilators that didn't get used during our COVID pandemic, thankfully. Um, but what's your advice for an ambulance service in regards to the amount of training, the length of initial training and the frequency of retraining um, that's required to keep somebody competent in using manual ventilation? To do manual ventilation? Oh, oh sorry, uh, mechanical ventilation. Mechanical. So I think, um, but okay, I have the bias of an anesthesiologist. And when I started my anesthesiology career, I remember that I was standing in the theater for half an hour, an hour, just holding the mask and try that. That was my start as an anesthesiologist. And the easiest way was after that, putting a tube in, putting the machine on and said, yeah, both hands free. So um, not make it too funny. But I think ventilation with a mask and the back is a skill, what you have to learn and to train. And it's more training what you need to be really good with your mask in the face. It's cost more time and more retraining um, than uh, using a mechanical, a, mechan a mechanical ventilator. At the end, you need, if you don't think about um, just non-invasive ventilation, but with the invasive ventilation, if you have a laryngeal mask or an endotracheal tube in, in the patient, then it's easy just to start with a maybe standard on the, on the ventilator and then customize, as uh, Cheryl said, then you can do all that uh, nice uh, things. And I think the learning curve is, higher and it's more difficult to be on a good level for manual ventilation when you use a bag and a mask than um, using a mechanical ventilator. If you have a tube and use a bag, I think this uncontrolled ventilation from my personal side as an anesthesiologist because we control everything in the theater. I think the learning curve is much higher and it's more complicated to do good ventilation if you do it manually than if you are on um, try to familiarize with a, with a mechanic, uh, mechanical ventilator. It's just technique. So there's some buttons you can press on. We are very familiar with that. And I think it's, it's easier to learn to do good ventilation with a machine than with right. your hands. Excellent. That's great to know. And um, Joshua has a question for us. Um, what are your thoughts on mechanical ventilation in cardiac arrest? Yes, this is a very, very, very good question. And um, I don't have the perfect answer for that. So um, in our daily business and our own system, as I said in the presentation, uh, being fast at the beginning, the typical uh, team in Germany are two paramedics with an ambulance car, two other persons, a doctor and an other paramedic on the emergency physician car. And the first team that starts normally carries a defib, um, the ambulance bag and all that, and they don't take the ventilator with them. This is a typical thing in Germany because you have two hands and you can carry something. So they start with the bag. And um, then it depends really on the systems. If you have a, um, if you ventilator on scene for that and we try to do that, but to be honest, not everyone when he's uh, starting carrying all the things out of the ambulance car, this is a problem with the bigger machines. And then the question is what will be the right way? We started years ago with 12 times 500 pressure or maximum pressure and saw that if you do it uncontrolled without the CO2, uh, monitoring, it may cause no ventilation. The same with pressure control. Um, the best way what we saw at the moment is if you do this pressure control, but if you control it with um, with the CO2 level, of course, the CO2 level is not the same in a 
cardiac arrest patient than in a normal patient. So you must see if there are some waves, if something is going in. And the best thing is if you have a ventilator that gives you an information what are the uh, airs coming out. There are some special other ways um, of ventilation, um, so-called special cardiac arrest ventilator forms. They are still under, um, not control, that's the wrong word. They are, are used, but we need more data. So maybe we have for normal ventilation and other patients, 10,000 or 100,000 of cases. For cardiac arrest, really controlled ventilation, there are not so many good studies what we can see. So I expect some more good answers on that really, really important question. And we are working on that also in our institute to figure out what is the best way to ventilate. But I'm absolutely sure what we did over the last 30 or 40 years just to do a ventilation is not enough. So sorry, um, um, Joshua, no perfect answer with a clear yes or no or whatever. But um, this is a very good topic and we have to find the right way for the patient. And the easiest way is control what you're doing, control the CO2, control the volume and see what volume goes in, what volume um, will go out and control it. This is the maybe not best answer, but the best answer I can give on that. Thank you. Um, Fadi asked a question regarding high flow oxygen therapy in MS. Is it a trend? Or will it be a trend in the future? Because you said that NIV in EMS has been increased recently in Germany. Do you, you think the need for high flow oxygen will be increased the same? Uh, um, Fadi, thank you for that question. Um, high flow oxygenation therapy is great. I had it on my own uh, at the beginning of 2020 when I got some kind of COVID and I was on our own ICU. And I was really afraid at the beginning of a CPAP mask and said with this uh, high flow kind of great. This is working on an ICU. We, we discussed it also for the helicopter. We also discussed it for the, um, for the ambulance car. In COVID, we said a clear no because um, we don't want all that um, arrogance around. In daily work, all the things with the heater, with all the other technical surrounding what we need for high flow at the moment. I can say in Germany, we don't use high flow in the ambulance, especially not in the helicopter because of flow. Of course, you need a lot of oxygen. Yes, coming out of the bottle. From the ventilators, you can use with a um, with a turbine. You can use also air coming from outside. Uh, nice, really, really nice. And I can say it on my own. This is something I can say. I just tested it, and I'm happy with high flow. But it's nothing for EMS at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Darius wants to know: um, Do you know what? Or is it a difference between ventilation devices using the external oxygen supply, higher than 95% oxygen concentration, and the device that is run by the turbine, which can ventilate with ambient air? Yeah, it really depends on what is the focus, what you're doing. If you need someone just help breathing, so it may be a problem with, um, with the, with the um, Thoracic impedance that you can say, okay, just need a pressure. The oxygenation is the need pressure. Then it's okay if we do it also with uh, with um, 21% oxygen. And it depends what you see in your patient. If there's an oxygenation problem, you need more. And then the combination of both, you can say 100% coming from the machine or you mix between 21 or 100%. It really depends on the patient. But it is a great backup what you have. Normally, if your ventilator drops off, and especially in the helicopter, and if the, the bottle is empty, you're from 100% ventilation to zero in one second when the bottle is empty. Now you have at minimum 21, and you have the same pressure, and you have the same um, volume what you can bring into the patient. So I think it's a, it's a backup, and it's more, um, more safety issue. But there are some patients that only need the pressure. Nice. But to be honest, normally in EMS, situations i see patients that also need oxygen so um, i'm happy to support more than 21 percent great thank you um sherilyn asked do you think there's a risk that operators can be lulled into a false sense of security with mechanical ventilation in your experience are paramedics vigilant with looking out for issues like ventilator um, dyssynchrony or pneumothorax etc I think your parents, and this is a <laughs> thank you for that uh, question, Sharon. Um, the Germans, uh, paramed German paramedics said, Oh, I, when I'm great, I want to be a paramedic like in Australia or in UK because I can do so many things and they are so high, uh, tr highly trained and so good. So, my paramedics in Germany sometimes said, The German system must change to a system like um, yours with 
high sophisticated um, pyramids. In Germany, we have high sophisticated uh, pyramids with a three year training, but we have also doctors on scene. But I believe, and I've learned my medical task as a paramedic and then and as an anesthesiologist and in the anesthesia department, also in the ICU, it's not a question if you're a paramedic, an intensive care nurse, or a doctor. You can train it. You can have a, you must see what happens with the machine. Just turn it on and off. It's not enough. So if you, if you use some machine, you must know what you're doing. But I, I'm pretty sure that a paramedic, as an emergency physician, ICU nurse, whoever wants to learn that, and he wants, uh, wants to focus on that, um, can use a mechanical ventilator in the same good way. And, and this is a big difference to a bag, you have alarm settings. If you run out of ventilation frequency, if you run, run out of ventilation volume, the machine gives you an alarm. So you can see something is wrong. You will be alert that something is going wrong. So I'm pretty sure and clear, yes, it is possible. As is possible. Of course, as paramedics will be uh, on a good level to control the mechanical ventilator while it's working. So it's not an on-off thing and then just go. You need to visit, and this is the reason why we anesthesiologists don't sleep and um, and read newspapers uh, behind the curtain when we are in the theater. We look on the monitor to see if everything is okay. Excellent. We're, we're virtually out of time. Um, I might Sorry? spit one more question in um, from Darius. From your experience, how important is it to monitor SpO2 in the emergency scene? As I said, um, I'm an anesthesiologist. I want uh, all the things what I can control. SpO2 is a very thing. SO2 is a very good thing. So if you mean really pressure, um, so with a um, oxygen clip, it's standard. The same as S with XCO2, it's the next standard if you ventilate someone. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So we really run out of time now. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, for your presentation. We've really enjoyed it. Lots of great questions. Uh, a great audience from all over the world. We actually had something like 45 different countries registered today to watch your presentation, which is amazing. So um, a great thank you to the audience out there, wherever you are Zooming in from today. And um, please um, join me in thanking uh, Jan for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure. Excellent. And um, can I just say to all our attendees, uh, stay tuned. Um, also, a big thank you to Wyman for sponsoring this presentation. We do really appreciate it. And they're a good friend of the CAA. Um, Jan, thank you. Hope to see you again in Europe in the near future. Um, for us today, uh, thank you. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Happy Christmas in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for attending Ventilation in EMS, manually or mechanical. To keep up to date, follow us on social media, Twitter at CAA Australasia, Facebook and LinkedIn, the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Enjoy the holiday season and we look forward to seeing you again next year.